When I was a kid, uh, some years ago, Return of the Jedi was the culmination, the end, the finale of Star Wars. It ended with a silly song with a bunch of Ewoks dancing around a fire and everybody happy. It was the end. And then there are billions of reasons, multiple billions of reasons why it did not end there. George Lucas made that amazing trilogy worse by adding CGI with the special edition. Came out in the 90s, went and saw it in the theater. Uh, it hasn't aged well. Not happy with that. Han shot first, FYI, in case you're wondering. And then George Lucas made it worse, worse, by releasing a, let's face it, awful prequel trilogy. I know millennials and whatnot who grew up with that might like it, but no, not me. Because it included annoying CGI uh, in the form of Jar Jar Binks, and I can't stand him. Uh, he's so annoying. And then they decided to make a sequel trilogy with Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher when they were a whole lot older than the young adventurers we remember. Unfortunately, that means we're older too. Uh, that trilogy was at least moderately good with some uh, redeeming parts. But what happened to that former grand finale? What happened to, to all of the emotion of it? lost in the shuffle now uh, that everything uh, has been remade and reopened up. There's my uh, lost youth rant thing. Uh, wasn't too bad. Uh, but I was thinking of that because I was thinking of culminations and finales and ends. Uh, and that one came to my mind because, of course, it did. Uh, let's take a look at Romans chapter 10, the first four verses. Paul writes this. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. We've already noted that the rejection of Jesus by his fellow Israelites broke Paul's heart. He started chapter 9 with that idea. So in addition to restating his love for his fellow countrymen here, this also reminds us of a crucial truth that Paul's generation of Jewish followers of Jesus Christ had already come to grips with. They had already wrestled with this and come to an understanding of this. Here it is. The descendants of Abraham needed to be saved. This is about their status spiritually, not physically or politically. As we saw last week, Jesus was the stone the people tripped over. When he came, it revealed that faith in God was not as prominent and as available as we had thought among the people. Whatever they were doing when Jesus came wasn't working. How do we know that? Well, quite simple. If the religious practices of Paul's generation of Israelites had been Stellar, exemplary, right? A work. If this was, if they were on top of things, they would have embraced Jesus. The widespread rejection of Jesus tells us that the patient is actually gravely ill, even if he looks healthy. That any hope for a recovery from that state will require change. To continue on under the established tenets of Judaism uh, as if Jesus had not come. As if the, uh, the arrival of the Messiah doesn't require a response from the people. That is not an option if the people are to be saved. Saul of Tarsus would have scoffed at the notion that a Pharisee as dedicated as he was needed to be saved, and we saw that from Acts in our earlier reading this morning. But on the road to Damascus, he talked to Jesus and found out how very wrong he had been. So he says, my, my brethren, my fellow Israelites, they need to be saved. Paul says, I can testify about them that they are zealous for God but their zeal is not based on knowledge. 
Hear Paul's personal knowledge of his own people. For until his conversion, he thought and acted as they did, allows him to properly diagnose this spiritual malady. Number one, the problem is not a lack of effort or desire. Laziness is often our go-to judgmental uh, attitude about problems that affect other people, right? If there are problems that affect other people, we often say, well, they're lazy. If they would just work harder, if they would just try harder. It's understandable that we do that because it's a very simple explanation, and it quiets our inconvenient questions that perhaps we or society have a role in their problem. And we would rather just say, no, they're lazy. It's simpler. Gets us off the hook. Is lack of zeal a real issue in Old Covenant Judaism? Is it a real issue in New Covenant Christianity? Well, of course it is. Apathy and complacency are struggles that the people of God have. But they were not the explanation, apathy, complacency. They are not the explanation as to why Jesus was rejected. The problem is deeper than that. It's more fundamental than just a character flaw of saying, well, the people weren't taking their faith seriously. They weren't taking their religion seriously. No, that wasn't it. Paul says, that's not it. I can testify they took it seriously. Because I can't help myself, here comes another running analogy. So, but it fits. It works here. You can put a lot of effort, a lot of sweat into running without getting much out of it if your training isn't based on knowledge. Believe me, I know this. There are a multitude of ways that you can run, and it actually is counterproductive, often because it leads you to injury. You can work hard and not actually get very far. First century Judaism would have benefited from the mantra, work smarter, not harder. The effort was there, but it was misguided. They wanted to worship and serve God, but the end result was not what it should have been. How is that possible? How can you put effort, can you put passion, can you put desire into religion and get nothing? Well, Paul knows the answer. They neglected to channel and focus that zealous commitment according to the will of God, according to the knowledge of what God had said. Here's how he explains that. Since they didn't know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. If you don't know much about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you might assume that the law given to Moses at Sinai would be the basis of the relationship that God has with his people. After all, it contains a whole lot of things that the people are commanded to follow, hundreds of things, along with significant blessings if they obey, warnings of judgment if they are ignored. On the surface, this law seems no different than how a king or an emperor would lay out his laws that his subjects are expected to obey. You must be thinking, if you don't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that this is how his relationship is established with his people. He gave them this law. But... And this is absolutely key. God's relationship with his covenant people did not begin at Sinai, where Moses received the law. That's not where it starts. Instead, it started more than 500 years earlier when God called a man named Abraham to come to the promised land. And Abraham responded to that call with faith. The faith of Abraham was credited to him as righteousness. Hundreds of years before the law was given, in fact, even before Abraham himself was circumcised, he was credited with righteousness because he believed. Faith in God was always the foundation. God's mercy and his forgiveness were always the catalysts 
and the righteousness of his people was never their own doing. Not for Abraham and not for Moses, not for anyone. Righteousness was always a gift of God because his righteousness is abundant and overflowing. So what happened? Well, as it so often does, human pride got in the way. Pride whispered to those willing to listen, faith, trust, and hope, they're not entirely necessary. Zeal, effort, self-reliance could win the day on their own. You can earn God's approval. You can mitigate, if not eliminate, the need for God's mercy to overcome your sin. Pride whispered these things. Dependence upon God is anathema. It is hated by pride. Pride proclaims self-righteousness. In our arrogance, too many of the people of God, or at least those claiming to be God's people, have looked inward with pride instead of upward with praise. There's a problem here. And it's a big one, because that self-righteousness is fake. There's no such thing as human-produced righteousness when you stand before Almighty God. We know all about fakes, right? Fake handbags, fake jewelry, fake watches. They're a huge business, actually. Rolexes with two X's on the end. Fake ones at a big discount. But in those cases, the real thing is actually real. Far too overpriced, but that's my opinion. But it's actually real. The real thing exists. Human self-righteousness was never real. It does not exist. It's the Loch Ness Monster. It's the Abominable Snowman or any of those things. I'm sorry if I'm bursting a bubble there, if you're a, a Nessie a fan or whatever. None of those things are real. Whatever we may think we have accomplished, however we squint with our rose-colored glasses when we look at our own lives, the simple and inevitable deadly truth will be that we are not good enough for God. Now, I'll take human decency over cruelty every day, right? I much prefer that people are nice in this world. But that niceness, that kindness, is not righteousness. God demands far more because his people must be like him. And God's righteousness is absolute. God's righteousness is not stained by evil like our attempts at it are. God's righteousness is not lacking. It is abundant. We call this perfection from God his holiness. And even the best person who's ever lived could not establish his or her own righteousness standing before the holy judge of the universe. No. Self-righteousness is a fool's errand. Obeying the law of Moses was never going to provide it. How then did Jesus overcome this dead end? If the law was a dead end, if there could be no righteousness through it, how did Jesus overcome this? Quite simply and quite powerfully, Paul says, Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Christ did this by literally, and this is the right way to use literally, literally being the end, the purpose, the goal, the fulfillment, the culmination of the law of Moses. It doesn't really matter to me which one of those synonyms we use in all the different English translations. Those are some of the ones they pick. The Greek word telos means all of those things. Paul's emphatic embrace of the triumph of Jesus Christ over the law by entirely obeying it every single day of his life makes it clear that he is indeed the end, the purpose, the goal, the fulfillment, or the culmination of the law. This law, the law of Moses, it crushed every single generation of Israel from his day to Jesus's. 
because it detailed for them their habitual and their spectacular instances of failing to keep it, not only when they committed adultery, not only when they stole, but when they did the simple, everyday kinds of things that were against the law of God that people didn't even really notice most of the time. You see, the law was a test, and nobody aced it. In case you're wondering, God doesn't grave sin on a curve. You see, all were declared to be law breakers. All fell short of God's holiness until Jesus. As the unique God slash man is the unique combination of those two, Jesus had the power to live according to the law rather than being an inspiration teaching us to try harder Jesus brought the reign of the Mosaic law as the guardian of the covenant people to a close. When Jesus said upon the cross, it is finished, the gospel tells us that the curtain that separated the holy of holies from the holy place within the temple that curtain that only the high priest could go behind only once a year on the Day of Atonement and only with a blood sacrifice to put that blood on the horns of the altar, that curtain was torn from top to bottom. The barrier that kept God's people at arm's length from God was no more. This was the completion of the law that God's redemptive plan envisioned all along. God's plan was always designed to take us to that moment. That the law would be temporary and not eternal was always God's plan. There are a number of ways that we know this. Here's one, the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to dwell within Jesus' disciples is one such example. What once was limited Access, controlled by that litany of ceremonies, was now available to every man, woman, and child whose hope is in Jesus Christ. We no longer needed priestly mediators to take us to the Father. We could go to him directly. We no longer needed the sacrifices of animals. We no longer needed categories of clean and unclean. All of that was now the past. It all came to an end the moment Jesus breathed his last. Now had Jesus remained in the ground in the grave, we might have wondered had God truly accepted this sacrifice. But of course he rose from the dead to new life as a demonstration of his victory. So you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, whether you were born a Jew or a Gentile, have never been under the law of Moses. Its time in God's redemptive program ended at Calvary. Now it remains as a tutor to help us understand the character and the heart of God. Why would God give these laws to this people? What was he trying to accomplish with them? It still remains for that, but the power that it once wielded over the Israelites was not transferred to the church that Jesus founded. Those who claim otherwise have failed to understand both the completeness, the absolute total completeness of Jesus' sacrifice and the sole basis of faith is our means of righteousness. Not our righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. And faith was the means of that righteousness in the sight of God before, during, and after the law's era of, opera era of operation. In short, anyone trying to sell you on the need to keep the Torah as a follower of Jesus is a fool. They don't understand what Jesus did for us. Christ is our righteousness. Christ alone. We started this morning with singing in Christ alone.
There's a reason for that. Our own effort, our victories, our accomplishments, they are but the glory of God because we accomplished them by grace. Righteousness has never been obtained by human effort. I could keep going, but those whose hearts are open can already hear that, and those who trust in themselves aren't listening anyway. Pride will keep them from hearing this. But those of us who have wholeheartedly embraced salvation by the grace of God through faith in Jesus, we have always known how to sing Amazing Grace. Three thoughts of application to help you remember this message. Number one, zeal for the law did not save anyone. Righteousness has always come by faith. Number two, the law of Moses was designed by God to be a temporary covenant. The sinless life and guiltless death of Jesus fulfilled it in every way. Which brings us to this conclusion. The righteousness we have by faith comes from Jesus. Only always and freely.